Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. It's a beautiful morning here in Halifax, and I hope it is equally beautiful wherever you are. As we begin today's event, I would like to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. It is my profound pleasure today to host uh, today's event. And I'm pleased to welcome the alumni and friends joining the conversation this morning. Before I go further, a few words about myself so you know a little bit about me. Um, I'm a bit of a wanderer. Uh, I was born in India, where I got my uh, the first stages of my education. Then I left for Australia to do my PhD. And in 1982, I ended up here in Canada at the University of Alberta. And my, I have been a career academic. That's the only thing I know. And so I started my career at University of Alberta, as I said. And I, from there, I have gone through, I went through four Canadian universities uh, from there to University of Montreal, to University of Waterloo, then University of Toronto. And at that point, uh, my travel bug again took me back to Australia, where I went down as president of University of Canberra. And then three and a half years later, um, I felt homesick and came back here to be the 12th president of Dalhousie University, which is my sixth university where I have worked. I'm a plant biologist by training uh, or uh, in more broad terms, um, agriculture is my field and I'm delighted to be at a university where agriculture is such a big faculty and, and such a big uh, priority for the university. I have had the honor to serve on uh, many national and international bodies, which I won't go into, but I'm just simply delighted that I have now the opportunity to serve this great institution. <clears throat> and of course, um, I have the pleasure of spending this hour or so with you all. Um, we're gonna get down to a conversation this morning with the two of our uh, very distinguished Canadians, but uh, and, and that conversation will focus on leadership, including what it means to be a leader navigating through uh, unprecedented situations like what we are experiencing uh, here today and have been experience, experiencing for the past year, uh, in fact, a bit more. And how can how we can leverage the experiences that uh, that uh, that we've had to strengthen our leadership styles and to emerge from the challenging circumstances in a stronger position, both for ourselves and for our institution. I will introduce today's guests in just a moment, but uh, let me first say a few words about, um, about the community that I serve and Dalhousie University. As I said earlier, it is my honor and privilege to um, have joined this growing community of Dalhousie University and of course, uh, Halifax and as president here of this institution that I have admired for so long. Over the years, I have been particularly impressed with Dalhousie's focus on education student experience that is imbued in its very research intensive environment. This is a unique combination that if it, in Dalhousie's case where there is such a strong emphasis on teaching and learning while pursuing top quality world leading research. And in addition to this, Dalhousie's features of uh, its, its role in advancing the economic and social development of the region and its ongoing dedication to building a more diverse and inclusive society, both within and outside the walls of the academy that have attracted me to this institution in particular. While I've been here, and before that, in fact, uh, the exceptional support that we have received um, from our uh, supporters and I would focus on this year, the, the, the exceptional, exceptional support that we have received this year through this very difficult time has made it very clear to me that Dalhousie has a strong network of friends and supporters without whom our success would not be possible. <clears throat> this network extends around the globe with close to 150,000 alumni living in more, more than 150 countries. So let me say thank you to all of you for your help and encouragement during these particularly challenging circumstances and beyond. Over our 
200 plus year of history, we here at Dalhousie have evolved to include new faculties, new departments, and new campuses. Yet, for all that growth, we remain a community united by shared pride in what we achieve together and what we give back to the world around us. In that spirit, in April this year, the Board of Governors of Dalhousie approved Dalhousie's new strategic plan, which is titled Third Century Promise. This plan was informed by extensive engagement with our communities and will shape our collective path forward. It is a promise of collective ambition, of community and support, and of long-term pos uh, positive impact that Dalhousie will have on Nova Scotia, Canada, and the world. We will officially launch the new strategic plan next week. I look forward to working with all of you in the weeks and months ahead to write the next chapter of Dalhousie's compelling story. With your help, we will raise our ambitions boldly higher and take this great university to the next level. So with that, let me switch to the, the uh, discussion with our, uh, our two guests that I have on the panel today. The first one of them is Karen Hutt. Karen Hutt is well known in the community. She is the executive vice president for strategy and business development at Amira Inc. She is responsible in this role for organizations, business development and strategy efforts, playing a re lead role in the company's next growth phase. Previously, <clears throat> she served as the president and chief executive officer of Nova Scotia Power Inc. Her passionate leadership was felt inside and outside the organization. Under her guidance, the team that she led heightened its focus on customers, safety, and delivering results. Karen is an active supporter of the local community. And in that spirit, she currently serves on the board of Acadia University. Uh, Karen is also the past chair of the IWK Health Center, which is which has an iconic presence in this community in Halifax. She has served as a trustee of the IWK Foundation Board, and she is also the past chair of the Junior Achievement of Nova Scotia Board of Directors. She has many, many other uh, roles that she has played in the community. I won't go through all of those, but uh, as I said, she's very well known in this community. Karen holds degrees from Acadia University and Mount St. Vincent University and has an ICTD designation from the Institute of Corporate Directors. In November 2019, in keeping with all the things she has done in the community and reflecting her role uh, on the national level, Karen was named one of the top 100 most powerful women in Canada for 2019 by the Women's Executive Network. Please welcome Karen Hutt. <clears throat> My second guest is another Canadian who is very well known across the country, the Honorable Frank McKenna. Frank McKenna is the deputy chair for wholesale banking at TD Bank Group and he's one of Canada's most respected political and business leaders. As deputy chair, he's focused on supporting the continued expansion of TD Security's global footprint. Frank is a graduate of St. Francis Xavier University, Queen's University, and the University of New Brunswick Law School. Frank has practiced in courtrooms all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada with some illustrious um, uh, victories uh, to his uh, credit. <clears throat> Frank was elected Premier of New Brunswick in 1987. His time as Premier was marked with widespread acclaim for balanced budgets and unprecedented job creation. In 2005, he accepted an invitation from the Prime Minister Paul Martin to become the Canadian ambassador to the United States of America. Upon completing his term there as ambassador, he returned to Canada to resume his corporate career with TD Bank Group. 
The list of awards and honors that Frank has received is just far too long for me to list in this limited time here for you. But to mention just a few, let me point out that he was the only politician in Canadian history to ever be named as the Economic Developer of the Year and was inducted into the Canadian Technology Hall of Fame. He was also inducted into the New Brunswick Business Hall of Fame and Canadian Business Hall of Fame. He has been honored by as the, as the Red Cross Humanitarian of the Year. Frank uh, is a member of the Order of New Brunswick, member of the Order of Canada. He has 15 honorary degrees from various institutions across the country, one of which is from Dalhousie University. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Frank McKenna as my fellow panelist here. Frank. <clears throat> all right, we have all both of us here with us. And so let's begin the discussion and I will kick it off with the thought that I believe that this pandemic appears to be on its way out, but as it goes out, it, his, its history will surely be written one day and probably soon. And when that history is written, in my view, leadership will be front and center in that history. So today's conversation will focus on leadership, what it means to be a leader, particularly when navigating through unprecedented and unknown circumstances, such as this pandemic that nobody would happen. And what we can learn during these times and how we can emerge from challenges that these times bring. So let's begin. So Frank and Karen, let me pose a question to you that during this very difficult time, um, the, the events of the past year have been challenging for anybody in the leadership position and you have held two major leadership positions in your roles uh, at, uh, in, at, at uh, Amira Inc. and at, at, at the TD Bank. What experiences you had in the past, let me ask you, that you feel prepared you to, to assume leadership, to, to, to carry on your leadership under these very challenging circumstances? So let me begin by maybe, uh, Karen, perhaps we can start with you and then Frank can join in, then we, we'll carry on the conversation from there. Excellent. Well, thank you. And, and first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation, Deep, to join you this morning. And Frank, it's great to see you again. Um, I guess I would start by saying I'm not sure that anything could have really prepared us fully for what we've experienced over the past mm -hmm. uh, year or more. Even if you did have a pandemic plan, it's been said it wasn't for this pandemic. And, and so I think as leaders, um, from my experience, it was really about peeling back the layers and going really basic and making sure, number one, we were doing everything we could do to make sure that people were safe. And, and certainly at Emera, that, that is a foundational focus of ours every single day, but everyone was doing that and making sure that we were activating our pandemic response plans and so on. And then it really became you know, focusing on our team and care, making sure that our team was okay. And I don't mean, could they work from home and could they be productive? I mean, how were they? How were they coping? Were people okay? Because there were a lot of emotional waves that people were going through. And so trying to be aware of those and trying to understand where we were in those different cycles and respond as leaders, I think was really important. And then of course, it was about community, yeah. connecting back to community. Uh, broadly, but more specifically for us, you know, we, we as an entity left downtown Halifax, our neighborhood. And so we wanted to make sure that we could find ways to connect back to them and, and to help. And so, you know, I think as leaders, it was every tool in the tool book you could find. But the reality was that there was no playbook for this and which we which we all come to understand. And so it was, I think, just having enough courage to put one foot in front of the other without knowing exactly where it was going to go. Thanks, Karen. And um, as I've often said, that there is no human being alive who has ever managed a situation such as this or led through a situation such as this. So this is all learning day by day, <clears throat> step by step. So Frank, uh, your thoughts on this? <clears throat> Well, uh, to start with, I'm uh, I'm flattered to be part of this, and uh, 
Mr. President, um, I, I read your resume very carefully before I agreed to do this. Uh, Dalhousie is very lucky to have you. you. You're a terrific leader. And, uh, and Karen, I've watched the arc of your career for a long, long time. And uh, it's, it, it's, you're somebody I admire enormously. So I'm, I'm privileged to, to, to do this. So I, I've had the, the great good fortune or bad fortune uh, in my life as a leader to be completely devoid of any knowledge of what leadership is all about. I've never read a book on it. I've never really uh, studied the subject. So uh, I've had to rely on real life experiences for almost everything that's uh, taken place in my life. And I don't know if it's leadership or not, but I've been through a lot of real life experiences in, in managing stressful situations. I used to be a trial lawyer. I did uh, dozens of trials, including numerous jury trials uh, on, on murder cases. And I can tell you, um, when you wait after two weeks and sit there with a, an accused waiting for, a, uh, waiting for a jury to come in, that's stressful. Um, but I, I went through that, I went through uh, five, four or five election campaigns, uh, leadership debates, there's nothing worse than doing debates on national television. Um, in, in several cases, I had to debate my opponents who were French, in French, on national television, when I could hardly speak French adequately, that was stressful. Uh, I've been through that, I survived a, a plane crash, um, uh, numerous debates, and then went through Meech Lake, went through Charlottetown, through Calgary, through free trade negotiations, um, all of which were extraordinarily stressful. I did softwood lumber negotiations when I was in the ambassador. And maybe the most stressful of all is when John Bragg makes me do two foot putts rather than gimmies. Uh, <laughs> I have to stand over that ball for three or four minutes trying to figure out what, what the ball is going to do. So I, I've gone through lots of stressful situations and all of that's led me to this conclusion that like the Bible says, <clears throat> this too shall pass. All of the things that you consume you and you think are kind of apocalyptic end of the world scenarios, uh, we emerge from it. And, uh, whether it was 9-11 or whether it's the financial meltdown in 2009 or the pandemic, um, the, the human uh, spirit is, is indomitable and seems to have a way of surviving all of these crises. And so if there's anything, I guess, that I've learned from uh, a lifetime of experience is, uh, is, is to take a deep breath, be calm, um, and, uh, and just rely on your own uh, instincts to carry on. Uh, there is no playbook, Karen has pointed out. You have to make it up as we go but we should have the comfort of knowing that it will pass and that we'll move on to something else. Thanks, Frank. That's very, very profound thinking. And, and But let me just say one thing to you that I've heard you speak French and um, I will say, <laughs> Monsieur, vous parlez très bien français. Okay. Uh, Merci so, <laughs> <laughs> and, but anyway, I, I think this, this idea of having no playbook um, but you know, but what I'm hearing from you is you know, as long as your compass is pointed the right way, you'll find the right path uh, as a leader. And you know, that brings conjures the thought of, you know, my own source of inspiration that as as I have had to deal with exactly the same kind of circumstances that we none of us expected this would happen, and it came upon us. So, you know, and the one one person that I've drawn inspiration from is uh, the gentleman whose photo you see in the distance over my right shoulder. That's my dad. Um, he was an accomplished uh, administrator in India's forestry service when I was growing up. And one of the things that I learned from him and well, dealt he dealt with numerous very <clears throat> difficult situations in a in a in, in a country and an environment which is constantly fraught with difficulties of all kinds. And one thing he used to go to whenever he was at folks was what does what principle applies to this situation what is the principle that would dictate this rather than looking at what is the most convenient thing to do at that moment what is the most principled thing to do and i felt that you know as we essentially fell into this pandemic that was one thing that i felt i was constantly inspired by you know for example the early days you know we were we were faced with a situation where we have, you know, a campus full of 20,000 students or campuses full of 20,000 students. And 
you know, um, the, the camp campuses have, and particularly residences, have been likened to to stationary cruise ships. Uh, and, and as you know, the infections were spreading all over the cruise ships at that point, and we had to deal with that situation. And plus, at the same time, we had these massive potential economic consequences of our actions looming. And the, the key principle that guided us at that point, not just me, but my, my senior colleagues, was that the health and safety of our people is the number one <clears throat> issue. We will deal with the economics of it. We'll deal with the financial consequences later, but we first must ensure that everybody stays healthy and safe. And that's the kind of thought that, you know, that's where kind of thoughts from my dad, they helped me. So, you know, in that sense, you probably had your own inspirations. You know, you, you spoke about Bible, Frank, and, you know, that's a great source of inspiration. There are others. Where, where did you draw your inspiration from, both of you? <clears throat> Yeah, well, in in my case, I, I, there's, there wouldn't be a, a single source. I I, I know, <laughs> uh, I know I know the people that I like uh, who uh, who are inspiring people in their own lives. Uh, that tends to really influence me. People who just lead lead good lives and um, and and who do really important things and are very altruistic. Those people all inspire me. At, at the leadership level, I've, I guess I've been around so long, I've come to know most of the leaders, the presidents of the United States have met, I think, pretty well all of them and prime ministers and so on. And, and they all have feet of clay. And that doesn't mean they're not wonderful leaders. In, in, in almost every case, uh, they have much to admire uh, because they are great leaders, but, uh, but they have human frailties as well. And I've come to understand at one stage, I used to put everybody on a pedestal. Now I realize that I need to reserve that pedestal for very special people. So the two people that I still put on a pedestal, I would say, uh, one would be Shimon Perez uh, in Israel, uh, uh, who, who I thought was a wonderful leader because he was able to keep the respect of both the Arab and the Jewish community and rise above, which is hard in the Holy Land, but to rise above uh, the issues of the day and have a more profound view. So I, I really admired that. And the other person I have to tell you is Nelson Mandela. And uh, there's just so something profoundly uh, inspirational, in, inspirational about a person who spent 26 years of his life in prison and yet was able to come out of prison without any anger in his heart. And I talked one time uh, uh, to, to Bill Clinton about um, what he turned to when, when, he, when he was feeling down and out. And he said, oh, Frank, he said, I had a lot of occasions when I was down and out, but he said, uh, my daughter Chelsea always used to give me balance. And she'd say, dad, look, you're having a tough time. Why don't you call Nelson Mandela? Uh, mm -hmm. I know how much you respect him. So there's one great leader calling another. And he said, I would call Nelson Mandela and I said, uh, Nelson, you spent 26 years in jail. You had every right to be angry and bitter and come out uh, and and want to attack, and and yet you didn't do that. And he said Man Mandela told him. He said, "Look, for the third, the first 13 or 14 years, I, I was all of those things. I was angry. I was bitter. Everything." And he said, "One day I woke up and I realized that as long as I carried all of that anger and bitterness in my heart." I was going to be a, a prisoner for life, and that as soon as I let it go and looked at my uh, at, at my captors as uh, uh, in a different way and showed them understanding and mercy and and uh, and tried to, to work with them, I became there. I they became my prisoner, and he said I spent the rest of my life uh, trying to turn anger around so that those who were angry were my prisoners, and I I just thought what a wonderful inspiration no message that somebody could emerge from circumstances where they had every right uh, to, to feel nothing but anger and, and bitterness and become uh, an inspirational leader, the only leader on the planet who could actually, I think, end apartheid and bring South Africa together. So people like that, I have to tell you, uh, are very inspirational to me. Thank you. Um, and, and, you know, those two figures come to my mind every time I think of leadership as well. And Karen, your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, um, you know, I guess I would start uh, b back at the beginning. My um, my grandmother 
was a woman who uh, I will always have the, the deepest uh, respect for, and mm-hmm. and she's still to this day a rock in many ways. She, you know, she was a woman of deep faith. Um, she was a poet. Uh, she could play the banjo and the harmonica at the same mm-hmm. time. Uh, and she was just a force and, you know, her, 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 um, she just woke up every day looking forward to a new and better day. And, and I think did that despite lots of challenges and life was not necessarily easy, but, you know, I think she taught us a lot about being optimistic. Um, if I fast forward to today, you know, last night I was trading messages with a group of women that over 30 years ago, I went to Acadia and met a group of women who to this day are, are some of my closest and, and uh, best friends and all very different. But um, the strength of that friendship and, and the bond, uh, I think, is just has become so important now. And, and I feel I feel grateful to have that. I think more broadly, if I was to step back and look you know, around us, um, I, I could not talk about inspirational people without certainly talking about the Obamas. And uh, there's, there's no question that I think they're matched when it comes to authenticity. And the world needs leaders to be authentic mm-hmm. at this moment. And I think they embody that. But I think Michelle in particular, one of the things that I really admire about her and mm-hmm. is that she's been so open about some of the challenges of her journey of being a working mom and how do you balance the, the friction that goes with that? How do you balance the, the challenges of having two professionals when careers are inevitably going to move back and forth and you need to make choices? And she just called out the, all of that out in a very honest, open way. And I think a lot of a lot of not just women, all of us need to hear those stories because we're living those lives. And so to hear people like that bring it down to a very normal place, as Frank says, you know, there's a there's a fragility in all of us. And to be able to be open about that mm-hmm. and honest about that. And I, I just think that uh, it makes you a, a better leader when when the people around you can understand that you're walking some of the same shoes they are. That's an uh, interesting comment you made at the end, Karen, that, uh, you know, there's a fragility in all of us. And uh, as we um, go through these kind of challenging circumstances we not only are managing we are also discovering we're discovering things about ourselves and that's one of the things that i've discovered about myself that you know i am not uh, the the invincible deep that i thought i was that i have my own uh, fragilities and vulnerabilities but at the same time that i must also make sure that I don't, my fragilities don't become a burden on others uh, because I, I carry the burden of looking after, you know, close to 30,000 people, including our staff, students and everybody. And, I, and their, their fragilities, their concerns, their, their preoccupations are paramount. Uh, you know, they, they take precedent over mine. Um, so, you know, that kind of discovery, I think the, 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 the crisis helps you discover yourself uh, to some extent. And, um, so, so let's go there a little bit. And aside from this particular aspect of this uh, pandemic, what have you discovered about yourself that, um, yeah. that you would like to share with others that can hopefully help others? Uh, let me start with you, Karen. Well, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say that it's, um, it's pretty easy to be a leader on the sunny days, isn't it? That, um, you know, it's not that hard when you're not dealing with, you know, problems in your business or dealing with customers or employees or whatever it may be. It's really the crisis moments that um, I think you see the most honest character traits. And I think uh, what you do in those moments is critically important and it will be remembered by people for a long time. And I've seen good examples of that and I've seen not so good examples of that. So I think about that a lot that, that and you talked about that, that people are looking at you and, and there's a moment in time where you, be brave in a way that perhaps you you aren't necessarily prepared to, but you have to. Um, and I think more generally, though, if I was going to step back, if I think about one of the biggest lessons that I've that I've learned probably a few times over, is that sometimes as a leader you need to know when it's time to slow down before you can speed up. And and what I mean by that is bringing everyone along for the journey is so important. It doesn't matter about the vision that you see. It doesn't matter about that. You can't bring people along. And if they can't paint themselves into that picture of success, it won't happen. It doesn't matter. 
And, and I think one of the things you have to understand is everybody goes at their own pace and they learn in their own way. And all of those ways are legitimate and they're critical and they're important. And you have to make sure that you facilitate that and bring everybody along. So it's not about you as the leader there. It's about you as being facilitator and being, being able to bring everyone along. And, you know, I think I'd, I'd say that I've probably learned that lesson enough now to perhaps be able to teach it. Um, uh, and as you might take from that, not always natural, but, but so, so important. Mm, thank you. Frank, your, uh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I really want to support what Karen had to say in a, a, a couple of aspects. <clears throat> One, you know, it's a funny way to put it, but we, we need to think of adversity in some ways as a blessing because it really is a character builder and we find out what we're made out of and it helps to shape us. Uh, uh, I think that's very true about adversity. Secondly, the importance of force multipliers. And by that, I mean the understanding that you alone can't change the world. But if you alone have an army of people who are motivated uh, behind you, you can change the world. And thirdly, the power of communication, which you talked about. Uh, a lot of people will go through a door for you, but they want to know why they're going through the door. Uh, and so it's really profoundly important that you communicate well. Uh, and I'll, I'll just tell you one thing I learned uh, about myself uh, uh, through leadership roles, a, a real weakness. And that was dealing with people and people issues. And I went for years as premier um, working around people, quite frankly, who were not in the right positions, who were not up to the job that they had. And I, I just spent a, a lot of my psychic energy in trying to do workarounds. And uh, I'd go home at night and I'd be pulling my hair out and I'd say, oh, and I, Julie was is always a great source of advice for me. And I just said, Julie, this, this is driving me crazy. I know that these people are not in the right place and they're slowing us down, but, uh, but I, I just don't want to hurt their feelings. And she said to me once, she said, you know, it may not be their feelings you're trying to protect, it's your feelings that you're trying to protect. And I realized that she was right. And after that, I started to, 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 to get some courage and, and stop doing workarounds. And I'd go to work in the morning and say, look, I, if you believe in what you're doing, and I did, and if you believe that you're trying to transform a, an entire province, which I believed in, then you've got to make the hard decisions, the painful decisions, to do that, and if you keep working around people who shouldn't be in certain positions, you're not doing your job. And after I, I came to that realization, I started becoming a much more assertive and I, I, I'd like to say in some ways courageous leader, but uh, it was a very, very painful journey for me uh, to learn that lesson. And uh, at the end of it, um, I, um, I just think I became a, a, a better leader uh, because I had a wife who uh, who who told me what I was really uh, worried about was uh, was was more the sensitivity of dealing with these things uh, than uh, than the reality. So it's, uh, that that you know the, your story about um, protecting your own feelings that reminds me of advice I got from um, a leader that I worked under. She was our dean, Mary Matthew, at University of Montreal when I was appointed director of a research institute, my first administra administrative position. And she sat me down and she said, Deep, I'm going to give you only one advice. And that is that leadership is about making choices. Don't be afraid to do that. Yeah. And so, you know, that's the essence of what you just said. I want to go back to something that both of you brought up, and that is that uh, leadership is not a lone uh, pursuit. It's not uh, a 200 meter sprint. It's, it's a game of hockey. You play with the team. Um, now, in in that situation, and to to some degree, you are, you alluded to some of the things that you need to do, but I want to make it more more specific. You know that question because that I, I assume that would interest a lot of people. Under these circumstances, you have a mission. You know that mission, but you need the team to carry out that mission and to get to the goals that you want to get to. How do you keep the team motivated and traveling with you? Uh, especially through difficult circumstances. Yeah. Uh, well, Deep, I'd like to take that because I, I want to 
I want to speak about my colleague Karen Hutt for a minute. Um, you know, for years, um, Nova Scotia uh, Power uh, was experiencing outages and uh, and and pretty pretty challenging storms, and um, and and they didn't, if I can be candid, didn't respond at the top of their game, uh, and it was a source of considerable frustration. And in September 2019, uh, Nova Scotia and our region got hit with the most powerful storm that ever ever struck here, Dorian, uh, causing massive damage. And there were 400,000 outages in Nova Scotia alone. And Karen was in, responsible at that time. And the way she handled it was, was a lesson in leadership. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, and it, it involved good communications. Uh, it, it involved uh, preparation, everything else. Um, but I'd sent her a note just saying I thought that was an extraordinary, uh, uh, an extraordinary job, and and I, I kept her words because um, I, I thought it was pretty important. She wrote back and she said we have an incredible team, and and all throughout our discussion today she's talked about teamwork, 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 and uh, and so she lives she lives her life that way, and it makes a huge difference. The people that we work with in stressful situations. It's like being in a foxhole. These are people uh, whose relationship to you is forged by fire and you'll never forget it the rest of your life. And it's really important to acknowledge their accomplishments and their role in getting us to where, where, where we are uh, and remembering to share the praise uh, always. And not just sharing the praise, but to call on people. Most people are capable of better of better um, outcomes than, than they produce. The higher you set the bar, the higher most people achieve. And, uh, and so a good leader not only supports the team, praises the team, but sets the bar high so that the accomplishment of the team is, is, is at its best. So that's, that's my say. Thank you, very well said. And Karen, since you were the subject of much of that uh, commentary, what would you like to add to that? Well, first of all, thank you, Frank. I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, what I'd say today is exactly what I said in that note back to you. The, the, the team was incredible. And, you know, one of the things that I said early to our customers and to the media, uh, once, you know, we, we understood what we were dealing with, was that our team were experts and stay safe and let them do their jobs. And, and I said that as much to them as I said that message to the team, because when your team knows mm -hmm. that you support them and they feel that support, they will do remarkable things. Mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't mean that, that you have to shy away, as, as Frank said earlier, there's times when you have to have the tough conversation. You do that in a way that's fair and respectful and constructive. But aside from that, your job as leader is to step up and champion your team wherever you can. And that will come back to you because people will just rise to that challenge. I've seen it happen over and over again, and, and it's incredible. Yeah, great. Um, we, you know, we've been talking for quite some time now. It's been about 25 minutes. And uh, I want to also uh, convey to those who are watching and listening um, that please, you also should join the conversation. You have access to a question box or comment box. Please type in a question that you may have and uh, our moderators will pick those questions and uh, I will see them on the screen and then you'll get a chance to get into the conversations. Uh, you, you won't be seen on the, on the screen, but your question mm -hmm. will be handled. So while we wait for you to ask your first question, let me, let me um, um, return to the pandemic issue. Um, you know, one thing that happens under uh, under situations of extreme stress, such as a crisis that we are going through or we have gone through, is that you focus um, singularly on getting the, your organization through that difficult period. But those difficult periods are episodes in the evolution of an institution. They are not there forever. They, they, as, as Frank said earlier on, even this shall pass. And they do pass, those, those moments pass. So you have to keep your eye 
on the ball for the for the long distance. And here at Dalhousie, we've done that. I mean, we've learned lessons from it. You know, we, we've learned something about the power of online, for example, something that we honestly, we, we had a theoretical notion about it. And if we had set out to do it uh, in a controlled way without the pandemic, it probably would have taken us 10 years to accomplish what we accomplished in less than four weeks. And, and everybody came on side and people just rose to it, the occasion in the way that I would have never imagined. And in a way also that this has become a natural part of the future of Dalhousie and every other institution around the world, that online and virtual learning will become uh, 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 just as ubiquitous as the Blackboard used to be when we went to the university. Um, but um, at the same time, we also discovered that uh, being with people in person is that it is also very important. People have been saying for, for a long time, and including some illustrious people like uh, Bill Gates, for example, predicted that the, 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 you know, the place-based university would be a thing of the past at some point soon. But we have discovered that we now have something akin to a place-free university, and yet we are longing for that place. People want to be together. People want to congregate. Mm -hmm. People, And that university education is not only about going to classes and learning your physics or chemistry or philosophy. It's about coming of age at the same time. And that is done uh, by being there in person. So uh, those two competing uh, realizations will play out as we chart the long-term future of this institution through this crisis and so on. So, so what I'm saying is that we've kept our eye on the on, on the ball for the long run as we have navigated through the crisis that's at hand. What are your reflections on that, you know, on this this uh, duality of responsibility to maintain uh, your eye on the future while at the same time uh, working your way through the crisis that you have uh, to handle? Can well, maybe, you probably yeah, maybe, right now? maybe yeah. I'll start. I think uh, I think you said something really important around the duality of this. I think we can have both going forward. Uh, I think we have now come to understand that uh, no question, uh, some of the things that that were you know the 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 bucket of you know COVID silver linings as we like to call them, uh, you know the acceleration in digital and technology at a pace that that we've we've now seen certainly it's hard to argue wouldn't have occurred otherwise. And and um, and I think you know how people have responded. All of all of those things I, I think are are important. There, there's a couple things I'd say. One is that um, you know I do agree that we will recover. I do agree that people will move on. But we have all kind of operated with this undercurrent over the past number of months that has been difficult. It's It's been full of um, fear and sadness and anxiety and all of these things that we've all had to cope with on top of just getting on with it. And so I think one of the things we need to do as leaders is really, really reflect that. Step back and make sure that we let people re-energize, let them heal, let them recover because, um, you know, I think people are tired right now. So we really need to be able to acknowledge that. But more broadly, mm -hmm. I'm with you, see that that we you can't you can't um we've been able to rely on years of culture building and that reservoir that we've been able to draw on to get us through. You can't build culture remotely, I think is one of the things we're coming to understand. So this idea that we would you know, we would mm -hmm. all end up abandon our commercial um uh leases and everybody go work from home. I think we're now coming as you know, no, 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 wait a minute. We want flexibility. We think flexibility is really important. So let's let's make sure we hang on to that. But boy, do I ever want to be around people. I need that. And so we need that as we think about bringing new people into our organizations, as we're helping younger people grow in their careers, that, that the culture of having people together and being able to feed off one another and learn and all of those sorts of things. I think we're now saying that is really, really important. We're not going to let them know. So quickly, Frank, uh, let me turn to you for any comments on that. Before we go to the audience, I understand there are some questions uh, coming through. Well, to start with, I just want to say, it, in a way, it's a luxury for us to be able to um, to look beyond the pandemic and, and, and look at other important operational issues uh, I, um, I went through uh, 
a situation that uh, I, I guess was quite um, emotional for me uh, uh, because it was quite new to me um, working in Haiti and I started to realize the difference between first world problems and third world problems. And I was down, uh, the first trip I was on, I was down there, uh, there were four hurricanes in a row that hit uh, Haiti, uh, a place called Gunaive. And, uh, and there was a, a, literally a river uh, filled with bodies and uh, a, animals and people and everything else. And uh, I, I went there with Wycliffe Jean and Matt Damon on a, on a relief mission. We were there. Uh, we were there during the course of this and uh, we were on the back of a truck and giving food bags to people and people were lined up hoping and praying that we wouldn't run out of food. Uh, they were lined up for literally miles and they're all women, half of them pregnant, uh, standing there up to their knees in mud and everything else. And one woman who could speak English, I asked her, I said, what is your hope from all of this? She said, my hope is to live one more day. Mm -hmm. And that just informed me, you know, that our life is so different from people who, who experience, we, you've been around the world, you, you know the experiences that some people have. So we have the luxury, it's a, and it's a luxury of being able to think beyond the pandemic of the moment. There's some parts of the world that are, it's just survival. Uh, but we have the luxury of thinking beyond that. And I want to say two, two quick things. One, I, I'm, I totally agree with Karen. Uh, remote working has, that's worked out fine. It's, it's, been a, uh, it's, it, it's, it's been functionally fine. But we are social people, social beings, and we need that socialization. I, I don't know about everybody else, but I think we're mostly the same. I, I need soul food. I don't just need a paycheck. I need, I need to be motivated by people and be happy around people and work as a team. I think that's important. Um, so I agree with that completely. Secondly, the importance of communication. We really learned a lesson, and uh, deep, you, you've done a masterful job of that. And Karen, uh, but we have to keep communicating even when the pandemic's over. We have to realize uh, that our knowledge is usually. Uh, based on more information than the people who work for us and with us. And it, we've seen this in the country where people will will literally set their clock to be able to listen to Dr. Bon, Bonnie Henry or to Dr. Strang and get the latest updates. We're all desperate. I, I, Julie tells me I'm a pandemic junkie, but I every day I follow the numbers in every province and the variations and the variants and everything else. And we rely on people for that communication. The political leaders in the country that have communicated well enjoy good support from the public. Those who have left ambiguous messages or haven't communicated well haven't done so well. Uh, and if you look at uh, President Trump in the United States, he had a, he had the election in his hands if he had only accepted the fact that there was something real here with the pandemic and communicated honestly and fairly and and not politically. And he, he blew it, quite frankly. So uh, all of that to say that um, let's not leave this crisis without learning s some really important lessons. And one of them is the importance of, of that socialization. But secondly, the importance of leaders communicating and being really open and honest uh, with people who work for them and with them. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Frank. Um, and speaking of communication, we are going to go to the, the to our viewers now. And uh, I have the first question in front of me. It's from Kathy Campbell, uh, who is, of course, first thankful uh, for the wonderful discussion. But the question is, what was your hardest leadership task and how did you make the decisions that you made? And Frank, let me keep you on the spot here because uh, you've done uh, perhaps uh, more, uh, uh, you know, played a greater diversity of leadership roles than than any of us. So, uh, why don't we go to you for this? Yeah, well, I I can't say that all of my decisions have been correct decisions, um, um, but but I've learned to make them, and um, and so maybe the I could get into particular instances. Uh, but rather than that, I'm just going to give a general answer to that. 
I found that I had after I kind of learned my lessons about uh, having to man up and make decisions from my wife. I used to get I used to notice I would get literally dozens of cabinet ministers or deputies in every day presenting me with the fact situation saying, look, what should we do? We have these alternatives, A, B, or C. What, what's your advice? I'd say A. And they'd say, oh, well, that's great. Thank you. How did you choose that? I said, because the difference between A, B, and C is virtually negligible. All you want is somebody to make the decision for you. I just made it. Uh, let's move on. And I learned that a large percentage of decisions are exactly like that. They're just not material enough to spend much time on. The secret of leadership, I think, is to know those really material decisions, five or 10%, and move them onto a different conveyor belt where they get different levels of scrutiny. And um, so after a while, uh, I became quite adept at, at just saying this, this, that, or that, and, uh, uh, and trying to recognize between what's material and what's uh, not material. Yeah, thank you, Frank. I will. Uh, we're getting close to the, the time, so I'm, uh, I have, I'm going to pose one more question. This one uh, is from Don Desserg. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Don. If I'm not, please uh, accept my apologies. I know that. Um, and uh, I'll ask this question of Karen then. Uh, what changes, positive or negative, do you see taking place post-pandemic with regard to leadership and our trust in leadership? Hmm. Uh, you know, I think that there's probably both, but I think it's more positive than negative. I'll say that because I think that we we have, um, you know, broadly as leaders, seen them step up in, in ways that history will judge them. But if I think about us in my own world and one of the dynamics that we've all gone through is the pandemic has brought everybody into our homes because of, of working from home. And so there's a dynamic to that that I think has kind of humanized us as leaders even more. I mean, your teams are in your homes, you're in their homes. And and so kind of having an appreciation of a person beyond who you see at work, you're seeing them in, in, uh, in different environments, I think is actually positive. And I think it comes back to the kind of humility, the kind of openness, the accessibility that people want of their leaders now. They want to be able to engage in ways and I kind of like to think that, again, you know, sort of in the silver lining bucket, this is one of those things that I'm not sure that we would have necessarily had this opportunity otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. And Frank, any last thoughts on this for, from you, especially on the trust and leadership? No, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, trust and leadership, I think, it, it revolves around uh, communicating. Uh, and, and, and look, the art of communicating is, is constant repetition. Uh, you have to repeat messages over and over. And honesty. Look, we all, we just crave somebody to give us the straight goods. And it and you know we have a saying in law that uh, that some statements have more credibility if if they're against interest. Uh, but the same is true in in politics or in business. And that is, if I say something which is not in my own interest to say, but I say it because it's my honestly held belief, that gets a high degree of credibility. And I, I think we all crave, uh, we just crave straight talk. During these difficult times, we really admire people who give us the straight goods. Thanks, Frank. And uh, with that thought and, and the time coming close to where we're supposed to finish, I'll go back to where we started with, you know, the first things I said that uh, the history of this pandemic will be written someday soon. <laughs> and when that is written, leadership will figure front and center in that. And, you know, if you look around the world, there are jurisdictions that have fared better than other jurisdictions. There are those that have done really, really well. New Zealand is an example where, uh, you know, an amazing leader has shown the leadership. And uh, we just learned yesterday that Auckland got named the most livable city in the world. And uh, and then there are places to, not to be named where, uh, you know, absolute disaster has visited those jurisdictions because of poor leadership. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in that sense, I think trust in leadership and uh, is not just simply a matter of trust. It's also a matter of life and death for people. And uh, so I think leadership will, we will be talking about leadership through this pandemic for a long time. So with that, uh, let me first say thank you to both of you for joining me this morning. Uh, it's so nice of you. I know how busy both of you are. 
and you still found an hour uh, for not just for me but for uh, I think more than uh, somewhere around a couple hundred people who are connected at this point. I, I will get the number and later on, but I know that there's a large number. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us. And then with that, let me also turn to our viewers and say thank you to you all, uh, because you have started your day with uh, this conversation on leadership, uh, joining Frank and Karen and I. Um, we hope, all of us hope, that you found this discussion inspirational and insightful and that you will continue to carry out this conversation in your, within your own organizations. And I urge you and, and encourage you to do that because I think leadership is critically important. So with that, let me say thank you again and wish you a great day and lots of good health going forward. Thank you very much and stay safe. Bye-bye.